I'm gonna, we're going we're gonna to necessarily have to talk in really big picture today. We have a lot of different disciplines in here. Um, I, you, you are currently in a room with some very smart people in it. Um, I don't know that I'd include myself in that, but you have a lot of instructors in the room. So we're going to take time to brainstorm and give you a little bit of time to talk to the people around you about what you're coming up with. There has been some, uh, some more recent research that has not so much introduced new ideas, but kind of more strongly asserted with evidence and forms of evidence, some of the ideas we've been talking about for a while. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to give you time with this when we get to it to talk a little bit about how you might be able to integrate this into the work you already do or maybe develop new work uh, for the writing for the class. Um, I have worked in a lot with a lot of instructors in a lot of classes where the idea of audience is kind of invisible. Uh, where, where well, I mean, we know you're the audience, right? But there's no real kind of discussion of what, of what that actually means and what it means to your students. So we'll talk about some of the details of the, assignment, the assignments themselves that you can clarify, expand upon in different ways that are going to help students get a little bit more engaged with the assignment, be a little bit more productive, do a little bit better work, which means you're going to have a little bit less work to do on your own. Um, and then towards the end, we're going to practice actually grading an assignment. You have one in your packet there. Uh, it's, a, it's a student writing. It's not actually student writing. Well, it's kind of student writing. It's a work of art, if you ask me. It's, I was trying to write like a sophomore. That's all. <laughs> so let's let's talk a little bit about some of the big picture stuff. Um, the copy you have, the the article you have with you. Um, I think there might be two. Yeah, there's um, two. Mm -hmm. uh, you're talking about how to create high impact writing assignments. Right. How to, how to create high-impact writing assignments? So this was based off of a very large sample of students of, of, of their work, the work they're typically assigned, and then correlating that with some of the, the standard ideas between what makes writing high-impact, what, what's most engaging, what do students learn the most from. Um, I think maybe an interactive writing process, or a, there's an extent to which this is probably intuitive. but. Anything in which you're using your class as a sort of community for, for students to, to engage with their writing, engage with one another's writing. Uh, peer workshops go a long time towards this regard. But when you stop and you have students within the class discuss their work with each other and with you, this, this makes for kind of a, an interactive writing process. They want this kind of this iterative process where they're talking to each other, they're getting feedback, they're moving up, they're moving on from the things they're already doing well adding things that they don't do well, adding tasks that do things, but this kind of this communal engagement, there are a lot of different ways to do this. Um, maybe the one you're most familiar with, if you used it before, would be the, the peer workshop, where you have students respond to one another's work. I've heard people complain about this and say, well, they don't, they don't know, you know, like, they all have commas places. They don't know how to tell each other about commas places. And if you're concerned about commas places, that might be an issue. But this is just kind of a, a community building type thing, where people feel like their work is taking part in a larger process where everybody's doing the same kind of work, everybody has the same kind of questions or the same kind of information. And just kind of, this discussion makes a big difference in what people are doing. And it makes a big difference in the impact of the actual things you're doing in the class. Um, meaning making writing uh, tasks, again, this is probably largely intuitive, but what they found in the study was that meaning making can mean all sorts of things, not just the standard things like, you know, demonstrate that you've been doing critical thinking. Meaning making connects very closely to the student's identities, the sense of who they are and what they're doing in the place that they're doing. Uh, if, for example, if you have them, say you, you're in a pharmacology class, and you're not, I don't think, um, but for an example, and you have them speak to people within their family about maybe illnesses that run in the family, or, or, or ways in which their family members have been personally impacted by a particular illness. You have this be kind of the basis from which they work, going off and doing research. This is meaning making to them on a deeper level, a more, maybe even a, a, a more engaging level. Having them be personally involved in some way in the work you're doing. And again, this can be really tricky because you don't want them to just be talking to themselves. You want them to be, to meet, be meeting higher standards. We'll talk a little bit about that as well. And the clear expectations are maybe the most important thing. One thing I might mention again, I've seen um, assignment sheets. So I, I, I don't know whether I'm complaining or, or claiming this. Uh, I have close to 2,000 consultations to the writing center, 50 more appointments. It's exact, exactly 50 at this point. So I've seen what your students bring in and don't understand and don't know what's going on or complain about. 
And I'll, I'll talk a bit about that, but the clear expectations are really important. I, I see sometimes instructors will say things like, oh, we'll just use any citation style, and that's not actually helpful. Um, that's problematic. I've seen some invented citation styles that look very close to a blending between MLA and APA, maybe a little bit of Chicago mixed in, <laughs> but sometimes that's what people hear when they say, oh, just use any citation style. So providing those clear expectations goes a long way towards making the results you get from your students better and towards making your grading easier because of that. Uh, the clarity is an important thing. Let's, let's expand a little bit on this, this middle one, meaning making. So uh, the, the article I have cited down here, and this, is based, this, this has led to a book since then, these are uh, bigwigs in, in writing center literature, uh, have shown that the things that, that create the most meaning for students are things that they have some sort of personal connection with, some sort of engagement with. Um, I don't think it'll be controversial, though it might, uh, for me to say that the best results you're going to get from writing is when students have some sort of engagement, some sort of they care about the thing they're writing for some reason other than just the grade. Um, yeah, so let's... This might be controversial. No, it's not. Mm -hmm. Just uh, let's read sometimes from the slides. Can sure. Uh, so tap into personal experiences, connect writing to peers, family, community, exercise agency. Just to say there's been studies that have shown that errors decrease when fluency and engagement increase. So a lot of times when students are so focused on just getting it right, they're over monitoring on the grammar side, they actually, the content isn't as good and also the number of errors go up because they're just focused on that. If you can get them focused more at first especially on saying something meaningful and interesting that they care about, the level of error already goes down and then you get them to edit for errors later on. Sorry. So agency can mean a number of different things, but where this becomes most simple is anytime you've, you've, if you've given your students an assignment where you've said pick a topic, that's some degree of agency. That's it. And it's, it's, it's important because it's important to help them get invested in what they're doing. Um, I'm going to expand upon some of this a little bit uh, in terms of creating meaning like making writing tests. I, I don't want to ask for a show of hands, although I'm tempted. Um, I don't often see, and I think instructors don't often set out any sort of writing which is ever in a genuine act of communication, meaning they're actually communicating something they care about in some way to an actual person somewhere out there in the world. Something other than just saying, here's, here's something I've written about what I know in class, simplistic prose about demonstrating what they, they know about the class. Uh, if you can ever find any way to have them engage in a genuine act of communication, this is going to be so much more engaging. It's going to be much easier for you to describe the audience and to talk about the audience's expectations and why they need to meet them. They'll have a reason for doing the things they do instead of just a guide of a, a rule book they need to follow and, and behave in accordance with. Um, you can have them connect things to their own experience. Now, this can also be their future selves. Meaning, if you have them writing something in class, and many of you do frequently, uh, that's, that's a in, in some ways going to, you're convincing them that this thing you're writing right now is something you're going to be continuing to write within this discipline, within this major. As you go on, if they can clearly connect that to something they're going to be doing in the future, if they understand the value of this for what they're going to be doing in the future, again, they're going to get more engaged, they get more engaged, they're going to, you're going to have better results. Better results require a little bit less feedback or a little bit less uh, marking at the very least as they're going on. And another thing you want them to do is, to some degree or another, this can be again difficult to do, we have a lot of disciplines in here, have them position themselves as the expert. Maybe they're doing a particular uh, uh, type of research that you're not discussing in class, but that's related to what's going on in the class. If they are the author, the, the, the expert in the subject, again, a deeper sense of engagement, a deeper understanding of what's going on. This can take all sorts of forms. Um, but let me ask, can any of you think, just kind of, Briefly, maybe something that within your field, within your discipline, within the class you're teaching, something that would constitute a genuine act of communication. Meaning they're not talking to you, they're talking <coughs> to someone else outside. Uh, maybe somebody in another class, maybe somebody in a future iteration of the class. Maybe they need to send something to a government official or a university official or a student organization to make a case for, some, for something they believe based off what's going on in the class. Um, this can be how they can connect the course material to their own experience. So, Let's just take a quick five minutes right now. There's a, there's a notepad out there. If everybody has something to write on, you can write on the back of any of the sheets you have. If you need a pen, let me know. Let's take five minutes. 
Try and brainstorm, what is something my students can do in this class that would be a, constitute a genuine act of communication? An actual act of communication. It could be, it could be any number of things. And we're gonna have a discuss, discuss this with the people around you. <laughs> let me, uh, let me, let me hear from some of you. Any of you about like a, anything that was a, a genuine act of communication that you can fold into your class in some way that makes sense within your class? But in, uh, so I'm from art department. So um, then I, uh, I teach him for many years writing class. Mm -hmm. And I usually, like, writing from paper, I divide on separate writing assignments. And sure. first writing assignment is to submit paper proposal. Mm -hmm. And what happened for years, like, the students submit paper proposal, first of all, it's the first assignment. They all, they don't know how to do that, what they would write there. And usually, so all these paper proposals were very, like, not interesting, and students just sometimes like put many different citations, etc., and or just simple definitions, theorems, etc. It's like it, it wasn't readable like previously. And uh, like then last semester, I decided to, to tell them so don't write one one, just write two paragraphs. First paragraph, please explain me why you decided to write about this story. So why, what, what is? And second write something what you already know about your topic. And this like small paragraph that I asked them to add about why they decided, it was just game changer. So like, of course, students wrote their everything about their girlfriend, boyfriend, why they decided <laughs> about their father, etc. But as a result, they got kind of fluency. Uh -huh. So the second paragraph about paper proposal was significantly better. <laughs> and with no, almost no plagiarism issues, no citations, etc. So like, this is like something that like a kind of icebreaker sure. that they started with, and then they have this courage to continue to. Write. So this, this kind of this, the their entry into this assignment was something personal, something, right. something exactly. that that they cared about already. Exactly. It's, it's sometimes it's easy. You just let them tell you what they care about, and then, <laughs> then you you build yes. from that. Yeah. What about anybody else? Any any sort of uh, yeah? I do. Um, I've done this for a few years. A public blog, so in um, gender and communication, rhetoric, the civil rights movement. The class decides on what the audience is going to be for the blog. Like it's going to be for A and M students, like a target audience, and then or it's a broad, and then it's about. Um, so like rhetoric of the civil rights movement, we may do something just on contemporary race issues. I think one year they called it colorblind question mark, right? And so then they. Or it's not like telling about what's happening in the class, it's getting them to think about, okay, how now that I understand black freedom movement's history, how do I then understand this debate over statues or whatever? Um, but they get to pick the topics um, and they um, write like 1,000 word essays um, for this public blog. Um, so it's, yeah. it's, 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 but it's, it's designed to be public. It's yeah. readable. It's yes, and and that's and, and that's the whole like we talk a lot about that. This isn't about them demonstrating that they know about the Montgomery bus boycotts. So this is about them. How do they communicate their ideas to Aggies about X? And that's what I focus that assignment on and use testing the history for a different assignment. I don't try to combine those two tasks in the public blog assignment. It's a good approach, especially when they know everybody can see it potentially. Right. I'm, anybody in a in a STEM field? Did anybody in a STEM field find some way to? Well, uh, I teach, or I'm over the microbiology labs, and that's where we have our writing, and it's a biosafety level two lab, so they have all kinds of safety uh, requirements there, and they feel like you're just making them do this. Uh, so we give them a paper they read about lab accidents or phone use in the hospital spreading infection. So we have, and then we ask them why safety is important to adhere to in the lab. So it makes them own it in a sense. I remember, I think I read that already. Uh, the one with the, how much, how much, how much stuff got spread outside of the hospital on people's mm -hmm. phones. Oh, phones are gross. They are. <laughs> oh, yeah. that is funny. People take them to the bathroom and use them while they're in the bathroom. Yeah. So there's all kinds of stuff. Oh, Everybody's laughing because you do it, right? Yeah. It's always interesting when you walk in and somebody's like watching TV. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm, I'm a student.
STEM and mathematics also at Texana, and I teach a little bit undergraduates, and in undergraduate classes, uh, I stole this from Oksana, uh, <laughs> that the goal is they have, have to write the text. It's about uh, acts of communication. They have to know what audience they target. So in the undergraduate classes, they should target their classmates. And actually, they look at each other writings at some middle stage of the process. And But I mostly work on writing with my graduate students, and it's a lot of work on papers and dissertations. And I try to teach them the difference of writing for researchers who are not in this specific narrow area, but in a broader area, writing for experts in the area, uh, preparing posters. So all of those are uh, different kinds of writing. But in all of them, I try to tell them that they have to, do, to be down to earth, even writing for experts. They shouldn't overload with technical terms, with many formulas. And the idea is that if you cannot explain this simply, this means that you don't understand it yourself. So that the goal is, even for experts, uh, you have to be able to explain clearly without overwhelming terms and formulas and so It's a good approach, especially if you, if you have them writing about complex material for an audience who's not in the class itself or haven't taken the class. And then, then they, also, they, they also demonstrate what they've taken from the class when they're doing that sort of thing. They show what you've learned. On day one, uh, when they walk in, I told, sent them an email, told them to bring their device. <clears throat> and we have a five minute nonstop speed writing exercise. The topic is anything you want it to be. But it'd be interesting if you make it about what you did this summer, because most I'm in engineering. Most of my students have been in internship. And so there we go. And I use that to introduce the issue of, yes, you can write even if you are an engineer. Uh, writing, um, sometimes it helps. This is a, a method you can use to uncork if you've got writer's block. But if the drill is to write nonstop. I tell them all I want to do is hear keyboards clicking. I don't want to see you backspacing, no corrections, no nothing. Just write continuously for five minutes. And I think it's a good way to get students into the mind frame of this course is different. This is a W course. This is going to have a different, different approach to it than the standard engineering course. And it allows to segue into other things that I do in the course. I think one, one of the, um, there, I've heard people express concern about having the assignments be too personal and like, well, you know, they're, they're, they're writing a lab report. Uh, how is that going to be personal? Um, the type of, uh, writing Jose is, is using a, the kind of the writing in class uh, uh, can be a meaningful way for them to get engaged. For example, the pharmacology example I was using earlier, that first paper where they write about something, some illness in the family, maybe they end up writing their final paper on the treatment options for a particular illness, but they, they, their entry into the subject came from something personal, something they're already invested in. <clears throat> something that I do with my writing assignments is um, when I'm introducing them in class, I tell them that if they are going for a job interview, to not wait for a request for their writing sample and to offer their writing sample um, and see if the interviewer wants to receive it. And then they have this um, document that we've worked on in class as their writing sample. So I try to kind of ground it in future use, sure. that it's not just a one-time thing and a one-time grade. It's, a, you know, you get a potential job offer out of it sometimes. It's an interview topic that you can discuss. And then don't wait for them to ask you for your writing sample. Go ahead and offer it. It's like, and they automatically get to questions about audience. Why, why is it important that you don't have comma splices? And things along that line. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about when you want to be the audience as the instructor, you can still help them understand you as an audience. Let's say you're having them write a reflection or a journal entry or something. Like, well, just tell them what it is you want to see from that. 
So it could be you want to see them demonstrate critical thinking, and you can define for them what you mean by that by showing them a sample of it. It could be that you want to know that they're being not only doing the reading, but synthesizing ideas from the reading or connecting that to their real life experiences. It could be that you want them to make an argument that shows you a new way to look at what they've been working on. Maybe if it, it, it could be, well, we talked about here at Exercise Physiology Lab. It could be that you want them to kind of think about, uh, okay, I'm doing this lab where I'm testing somebody doing an exercise and, and keeping track of what they're doing, I think, right? Yes. <laughs> and so maybe what at the end of that, I want to make a recommendation that that exercise be changed, or I want to suggest a supplement that would really enhance people doing that, you know, that, that are using that exercise for some specific reason. So it could be that they want to show you as the instructor something new they've learned, make a good argument to you, show them that they've show you that they've done the reading. This is especially useful in journals where they don't they they may have a mixed understanding of what journals are for because maybe previously journals were only for like recording personal things and now you're asking them to write a whole different kind of thing you really want a critical reflection so making sure they understand what you as an audience even when you are the audience needs is important so Keep in mind this kind of this idea of, of some way to integrate them personally, either their community, their family, uh, their experience of the world into what they're doing. I'm going to talk about some really big picture things here, uh, again, out of necessity. Uh, your goals for every writing assignment, maybe you have many, but these are three kind of uh, cardinal uh, things. Clearly defining what you expect the students to accomplish is really important, and this may require some, some digging into what, what you're doing. There are things that are apparent to you. You've, you've heard the, the curse of knowledge. <laughs> when, you, when you become so knowledgeable about the thing you're doing that you forgot that at some point you learned it. Um, this, this is a helpful way. Bring, bring this up in discussion if you can. If you have expectations, write them out as clearly as you possibly can. What, what do they need to accomplish over the course of this assignment? And then you have support and explanatory, explanatory materials. As you know, any, well, if you, if you know, any W course at the university at Texas A&M requires a, a degree of instruction, formative feedback as you're going through. So you want to build this in. So this is something we, we were just discussing. You want to be very clear about the idea of the audience. Um, if this, this, again, it goes unspoken, un, unspecified uh, many times. I've done classes and workshops in classes, and I've said, so who's the audience for this paper? And the instructor hadn't thought about it and said, well, I guess me. I'm the audience for the paper. Oftentimes, you're, you're functioning as a surrogate audience. You're a virtual audience. You are assessing how well the student is speaking to a different audience, an audience who isn't you. But clearly specify this, because this has a lot of, important, uh, a, a lot of importance attached to it for, for the reason of expectations. If they're writing to an audience that isn't professional, do they need to adhere to the same standards of academic grammar? Right? These are things you want to clarify. You want this to be real. So if they're, if they're writing to classmates, you should, you should, maybe you want to specify, even though these are your classmates, it might be your future classmates, you, was, you still want to communicate the st academic standards of the genre as they're going through. Clearly, clearly clarify this, but maybe you don't care about this. Maybe this is the beginning stage of assignment where they're just generating ideas for some big thing they're going to work on, and the grammar isn't as important. And they're writing to their peers. They're just making a quick persuasive case. Uh, you want to specify this as you're going on. Another place this comes in is if you are positioning them as the expert in this, this, this area of writing, one of the good things about that is you, they have to assume that the people they're speaking to do not have the same level of expertise, which means that in the course of doing this, they'll demonstrate what they've taken from the class, what they've taken from the class discussions, the class materials, uh, uh, the, what they've been doing in the class. If it's some area where maybe they proposed a particular course of research that doesn't get discussed in class, they are the experts on this, they're the ones with the knowledge. If they're speaking to their peer group, they need them to, to show how the information they've acquired is useful within the class or useful to their, their, their fellow peers. Um, I, I saw one assignment I thought was really interesting. It was a performance class. And the instructor wanted the students to make the case that a particular aspect, a particular interpretation, a particular type of dance, I believe it was, uh, exemplified 
the cultural studies they did in the class about the importance of dance in a particular culture. And so they had to make the case to their fellow students that this particular group should be included in the class going forward. They're going through. So you have the clear expectations. They're speaking to an actual audience. So professionalism is important here, especially with something like a, a, a writing sample or a cover letter. And this is going to be important in most cases. And in most cases, you're going to want them to adhere to the standards of academic writing. Uh, Academic writing is a, it's, it's a graphalect, it's called. It's an ultra-correct, ultra-conservative form of language. Uh, most people aren't going to have this. This is where you might need to, to send them out to places like us, to the writing center. We can help them, we can help socialize them to this. You can do this with the classes they're going through. A lot of, a lot of what you're doing at this level is actually social, socialization. You're getting them socialized to a particular culture, a particular set of standards as they're going through. So we want to be clear about the purpose of what you're writing, what, their, what your students are writing. If you expect them to apply course concepts, express that clearly. If you don't, if you expect them to, to, to create new research, you still want them to be informed about what's going on in the class to some extent. Um, writing in the disciplines is really important. Uh, for example, with uh, uh, the, the, the writing sample, when you have them submit something like that, is it writing that would be typical within the position they're working in, within the position they're going for? Yes, yeah, so this is a client project, and they do, it's consulting where they have to come up with marketing strategy for the client. Um, and then that's all, you know, that can be used across many, many different types. Um, so yeah. I've, I've just been informed that the coffee is ready, so I'll just, I'll, I'll talk a couple <laughs> more minutes. And we could, we, could, uh, we could grab some of that. I know many have been patiently waiting. So when you have something like this, when you have a particular discipline, uh, industrial engineering has particular standards for writing. Uh, uh, any, any one of these fields has particular standards for writing. If you start off with something that gets them personally invested, it's going to be much easier for them to use these standards as they go through. Because you can talk to them. This is about your future self. You're going to need to write lab reports for, 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 the, for eternity after you graduate from this discipline. As you're going through, you give them that kind of, the, 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 the sense of this is going to be important to who you're going to be from this point forward as you're going in. Uh, where something like a cover letter is obviously that, something like a writing sample is obviously that. Um, and you want to also be clear about what specific skills you expect the students to use to accomplish this assignment. Uh, there's a, this is the sort of thing I think most of the time we feel safe assuming. Uh, well, I assume you know how to cite. I, I assume you know how to, how to how to use the, the introduction method results and discussions format. Uh, we don't want to take this for granted. And you can spell out the skills you expect the students to use. Literally, bullet points. I expect you to, I expect you to, to cite an APA format, to use correct citation style. Spell it out. It's obvious to you. Maybe not obvious to everybody else. Um, can I ask a question? Yeah. You mentioned things like go on the stand up some academic crowd writing and rigid standards in an academic writer. I have never known the answer to the following question. Uh, should the academic writing formal or more colloquial style? I personally cannot read uh, <laughs> formal academic writing. It's just I have a friend who gives exciting wonderful lectures, but when I read his papers, it's like chewing sand. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you're slogging through. <laughs> I, I personally write in colorful style, like I do in, in the lectures, and it looks like people like what I write, but my, many people consider this a big no-no. I think this is something you can really easily fold into the audience. What are the audience's expectations? Sometimes the audience will have the expectations to grapple like It's no fun to read that stuff, but, but they're good. most students are going to need to write that thing. You know, I'm fairly convinced, and I have no evidence backing this up, maybe it just makes sense, that when, when people are undergraduates and they're BSing to get to that five-page paper count and they, so they stretch out the sentences and make them all really long, a lot of those same students go to grad school. And then they continue writing this way, and they think, oh, it just worked this far. And I'm pretty sure that's where the academic writing style came from. I need to take this one. Okay, so I agree with you. However, 
We're not always, it's not always agreed upon. This is controversial within our disciplines. Depending on the discipline, anthropology has a lot of controversy over this, depending on what kind of anthropology you're doing, whether you can use I, for example. So all of these controversial things that change over time are very of interest to your students, especially graduate students. They should be hearing about these controversies and thinking about it. Coming from English, we had a lot of, um, a lot of discussion about this in the 80s, about people using like theory speak and so on. And, you know, I, I'm, well, I agree with you. I think that those, those standards do vary, not only across discipline, but within discipline. And these are important issues for students to understand that, that not all writing is like there's just one size fits all. It changes, and it changes with audience. The other thing that you were talking about is there's a, a, a famous research about inventing the university that students come, and one of the things they try to do is imitate formal, um, academic language as they understand it and it, it results in this very fancy stilted kind of wordy style and really all they're trying to do is sound like they think that they should sound like yeah. so giving them <laughs> Jose you might want to say something on that but giving them examples of good clear concise writing and encouraging that it's never going to hurt them so I am with you and as long as they know especially as grad students that there's other things. And one way you can do that is show them samples from your discipline. And show them samples that do in different ways and say which one would you rather read. I think um, I'm going to put something up here just really quickly. Uh, let's take about five minutes, get some, get some coffee. Try and write down what, if you, what you think of would be the purpose of maybe one of the ideas you have for, for your uh, for, for, for actual writing, what is the reason students are writing the thing they're writing? It might be one of these. You want to get the words like this. You want to spell the expectations. But also think in terms of a long-term assignment, like an end of semester assignment. Think of what, did, what would be the ideal purpose you would want students to accomplish in here. We're going to go on to scaffolding and talk about that just a little bit in a, in a minute or so, um, probably pretty quickly. Uh, uh, but I just want you to think of this big terms in terms of the literal purpose of the paper. What is the reason for its existence? Why does this exist? Uh, so here are some examples. Uh, an analytical paper, when it, the purpose of the paper is analytical, it says, what is value of students' ability to examine closely the connection between the parts and whole of a particular subject and their ability to investigate and articulate the way ideas connect to or contrast with one another? The informational purpose, what is value of the students' ability to summarize and synthesize information about a particular subject? Um, an argumentative, what is valued is the student's ability to articulate a claim about a particular subject with appropriate evidence to support such a claim. So think in these big general terms, but also think about how these might apply to maybe an assignment you already assigned in your class. Uh, really clearly spell out what is the purpose of this assignment. Also, we have coffee. So coffee's, coffee's ready. Let's take about five minutes. So one, one of the reasons I have all these categories written out up here is because I see a lot of writing assignments where people will people will write analyze this and and don't necessarily understand that analyze is a, is a very specific action and you often have very specific thing that's things in mind when you're talking about analyzing things. Uh, the definitions up here will help. When you when you give when you give somebody one of those verbs, when you give your students one of those verbs, make sure you're you're clear what that means or what that means to you because there's even some wiggle room in there. Um, so if you choose a purpose along these lines, again, spell things out even when they seem incredibly apparent to you. They may not to your students. Um, let's talk a little bit about where we go from here. So if we have some sort of, uh, of entry, if we have a, something that's going to bring students into it, some sort of personal connection, some sort of sense of how what they're doing now is going to be important to their future self, or how what they're doing now expands on their understanding of where they come from or, or their family or something along those lines. Some sort of entry. And then we have a you have a clear sense, and you clearly communicate, here's what I want you to be able to do with this sort of information. Here's what I want you to be able to demonstrate. Uh, we do want to get the idea of scaffolding in, where you build something up over the course of the semester, where everything that follows from the previous assignment builds on it in some way, and then you have the big product that comes in at the very end. Um, to use an example I used earlier, if you had somebody uh, start off writing about the uh, the illnesses that are in their family and how, how, what family members suffer from them, what they do, what kind of treatment they have on. 
that might be their entry into the second step might be them conducting research on this particular illness, putting together an annotated bibliography. So this would be the second step, step in a scaffolding process. You know, building off this initial thing that they already have some sort of investment in, some sort of personal investment in. Maybe the next thing they do is, uh, is they, they write a method section for a paper that's going to be about uh, uh, the best possible treatment plan, how they determine what the best possible treatment plan for disease X was or something along those lines. Uh, you build up. Every following step, step builds on the previous one as you're going through. Again, there are a lot of different ways to do this. So another way you could do that is if you're doing the, the typical kind of scientific method paper introduction, uh, method results in discussion, you can have them start by writing the introduction. And the introduction is going to have a little, like, short literature review, for example. So you're going to focus on explaining to them the purpose of that is to set the scene and to help people know what it is you're going to be um, discussing further on. What, what I forgot findings, of course. Those are rather important method <laughs> findings. Well, I said results. but So you know, setting that up, and then once they've written that in a draft form, then they turn it in with the uh, with, uh, methods or materials next, but they include the intro and they make revisions to the intro now that they've added methods. And then they turn it in, they do their work, they get their results, they turn it in with their findings and their results, and they keep like building that paper and making it larger each time. But each time you're encouraging, do you have to revise your introduction based on your findings now? Are you still in the same, you know, and it, it's not going to need a lot of revision, but it might need some. Uh, it could be that it's getting too long now and you got to cut that down and you know you, you have to make it a shorter intro because you don't have as much space or something like that and then you keep going until you get the final paper. Uh, well, actually, uh, I usually advise my graduate students to write introduction to the paper as the last, as the last step. It, exactly it, since otherwise you will have to rewrite it every single day. <laughs> Well, I don't mind making them rewrite. I think it's good for them to rewrite. But if you're going to have them do a literature review first, that part of the you could do that part of the of the introduction, just depending on how you do an introduction. Um, but I agree that very often the introduction is the last thing written, and that's a, that's a good practice. But having them revise is also a good thing. So, you know, and seeing how that, uh, like how the paper changes over time is also a good thing. So I guess I, I can't imagine doing, not doing the literature review first. So one of the good things about this, this scaffolding method is you want the assignments to increase in complexity as time goes on. Ideally, you would have them build and add to each other, meaning if you, you start off with a, a lab report that then becomes a method section, and the next thing you write is, is your introduction. And until you have an IMRAD paper, an introduction method results in discussion at the end of the semester, or something along those lines, which might be kind of a big task. But, you know. So you want, to, want these things to increase in complexity and the end product to get more, more, more engaging, more elaborate, bigger as time goes on, particularly if they can connect that directly to who they're going to be in the future or what they're going to be doing in their discipline. There are a ton of different ways to do this. I have seen so many different ways to scaffold assignments. I remember I worked with an engineering class one time where they did a concept map as the first thing they did for the, for the assignment. They mapped out their concepts. They, did, they weren't writing anything. They were drawing the concept map. Then the next step was kind of explaining the concept map and how they were going to apply it in their future work as they were going on. There are a lot of different ways to do this. But remember, you want to increase the complexity. You want to start with them having something personal. Some, some personal stakes, some personal understanding of why what they're doing means something, and then move on from there, move on from there. Increase the complexity as you're going on. So let's talk a little bit about what the first potential step for a scaffolded project could be. Um, again, it could be any number of things. This is where you're, you're starting out, though, with, a, with kind of really laying out, at least in your own head, but even better on paper for your students, what will students need to complete this first step? What are they going to need? If they're going to write a proposal, for example, for a class, what do they need? To, what is a proposal in the first place? What, what does that mean? Somebody's getting married? I don't. <laughs> this is, again, people who've been in academia for a while. This just seems so incredibly self-evident. It seems almost pointless to explain it. But to an incoming class, you might need to explain it as you're coming in. So maybe they're writing a proposal. Uh, Maybe you want them to, within the proposal, list the sources they're going to use, list their research. Uh, one thing I'll point out here that I haven't mentioned yet, but, and I probably won't mention again, 
The timing is really important with things like this. I mean, if you're going to have them propose something related to the class, something that's important to them, you don't necessarily want it done in the first week of class when they haven't had much lecture beforehand. You really want to think about the timing for things like this because it's, it's significant in, in the results you're going to get. Um, let me read the example up here. For example, the first step of a research paper may be a list of sources with a summary of each source. The first step of a facilities report may be an inventory. The first step of a scientific paper may be a lab report that will later be transformed into a methods section. So you want to scaffold. Start with something relatively simple within the major that you're going to build on from there. Um, have a clear sense of what skills students are going to need to do this. One of the good things about scaffold assignments is it, it builds in multiple instances of feedback. And this doesn't need to all be your feedback. You can do peer review at some stage. Uh, you can have people come by the writing center at some stage as they're going through this. But as they're consistently getting this feedback, your expectations become more clear to them. They're more likely to be able to meet those expectations. So by the time they hand in that final product, they've had all this instruction leading up to it, all this kind of socialization of what's going on. So you want to clearly also communicate this first thing you're doing, what part of this, how does this become part of the final assignment you're doing in this class? Uh, in a history class, if you do a, 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 a research plan or something along those lines, it makes, you, you, you clearly explain, this research plan is a means of you making sure you're using the time in the best way possible to get the best sources you can do to complete this final product as you're going through. You really want to clearly spell that out as you're going through. So, at this point, you have a sense maybe of, uh, of the purpose of the, the, the writing in the class, maybe some, some specific thing. Maybe you have some examples of specific uh, uh, real communication that they're going to be doing in this class. Maybe this could be part of the scaffolding process as you're going through. Um, with that, let's, let's spend just a few minutes. Well, no, five. Uh, five minutes. Uh, think about in terms of scaffolding, the assignment, the purpose you want your students to accomplish with their writing in your class. But think what might be the first discrete step that they do. How is this going to relate to the larger step overall? And what are you going to expect them to be able to do right at the beginning? All right. If you spell this out, it'll help with the planning going forward. So let's just take like, like five minutes. Do I have to say howdy? Is that required when I'm in a room full of instructors? Howdy. Howdy! It doesn't work with me. <laughs> so I, I'm kind of curious uh, about maybe some of the first steps any of you come up with. Did, did you, maybe something you've adapted from something you had earlier or something you already had? Or something you came up with? What's, what's the first step? What's going to give your students entry into this big project that they'd be doing over the course of the semester in a scaffolded project? In the course, in the course I teach, we have them do a, a sort of a every man analysis of a system that they're going to work to analyze in greater detail. It's human factors, but we just have them observe observe the system and make comments based on their own intuitive uh, assessments and their current knowledge. And that's the first step. But this applies because they're doing a long term analysis of that same system by the end of the semester, and we expect them to incorporate the technical knowledge that they acquire through the course. You know, um, some of the, the research I showed earlier where, where, where students are talking about the most meaningful writing assignments they had, and usually it's, it's something connected to, to their own experience. One of the factors that made their writing assignments that they specified as meaningful was uh, the sense of accomplishment. So that something that would be neat with that is when they're describing things in layman's terms and then later on they understand the technical terms for and they can look back and see, oh, I used to call this this, and this is this, and this is actually this. Yes, yeah, so just as some insight, the, the, one of the systems, systems we've had them analyze are those drink dispenser machines. We have in some of the restaurants here that have the screen, and you have to hit the right button to get the thing to go into the cup, and there are usually no, there are no instructions. It's supposed to be intuitive. <laughs> and you wonder why you end up with orange Fanta in your Coke. <laughs> How did I get every type of every soda? <laughs> <laughs> so my, my class, they have a capstone project, and so the writing doesn't necessarily build what I thought I, I might do as a tool is set up and show them the, the actual sec big sections of the capstone project that, that the group is going to end up with and how each assignment, have them figure out where each assignment they're building it. Where is it going to fit in this capstone report? Oh, sure. 
So it was a, it's a little different. It's scaffolding, but it's, it's different in terms of not necessarily building on writing and, and all, but sort of knowing that you've got lots of different pieces to put together to create a good written project. Well, and also if they're getting feedback on the pieces as they're putting before they put all the pieces together, that's, that's a fantastic way because they, they start internalizing those expectations as they go on. So with Valerie, I'm, I teach a course in ancient Egypt, and uh, this, in, this spring will be the first time I'm teaching, and what we were talking about was uh, at the beginning of the course, sending them to the library to 6th floor in D.C. is ancient Egypt. And just pick any book you want that interests you, that you're curious about, and write a uh, book report on it with the bait, with the headings of guess what, here's what, so what. All right. <laughs> I teach a teaching course for graduate students. And um, first step would be choose what I call my ideal course mm -hmm. for uh, them to work on all semester so that. Theoretically, at the end of that teaching course, they would be prepared to teach that course. And so it can build in terms of, it. well, the final product is a syllabus for that course. But it includes the teaching philosophy. They have to prepare a, a sample test, an assignment. But it starts out with identifying the course uh, and basically what they would want students to get out of that course. That's so that's got a nice scout. The, the survey I was talking about, and I, I had it uh, cited up there earlier, uh, Students expressed a lot of satisfaction with having worked on a semester-long product and then getting to the end and having something like, like a syllabus that they're actually going to use that's meaningful for them, that's going to be part of their life going forward as they're going through. So it's a, an effective way to scaffold things, and it keeps people personally engaged as they're working. So um, again, I've heard a lot of, lot of just, just whatever you want. I, I generally recommend. Uh, really nailing down the format expectations just so you don't have anything weird in between. Because most of the time, I mean, I don't care. But I've also seen students who use Unicode font where each letter takes up exactly the same amount of space so it doesn't kern, which means the writing takes up more pages, right? <laughs> so, so just set it out there right away so you can stop thinking about it. Now, one thing you're going to want to talk about within your discipline. Um, so we have, we have uh, Chicago style in history. We have, we have APA in a number of fields. Um, when you set out a citation style or citation guide, take the time and explain to your students why you're doing this. Because a lot of them, to us, citation is just, we know it. We understand it. It's, it's, there's no need to explain it again to anyone here. Where for students, this is often quite mysterious because by the time they get it recommended to them, they've had no preparation for it. Oh, just cite an MLA format is way more complicated than it sounds with somebody who's never had to cite anything. Right? So you want to spell this out. You also want to connect it back to the discipline. Remember, this gives them a sense of their future selves. How, does it have, how is this still going to help me in the future? Meaning, if I'm going into history and I'm learning how to cite the Arabian or Chicago, I know I'm going to be using it. Like, I, I know this is going to be part of what I'm doing going forward. I know I'm going to need to have this skill as I'm going through. So I, I recommend really putting down the format expectations, just nailing them down and leaving them there and forgetting about them. But also taking the time to explain why a particular cit citation style is meaningful, making sure they have the resources to understand what citation is and what it's supposed to do. Yeah. Do you guys recommend EndNote? Because it's free yeah. to students. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, EndNote, the, the, there's resources from the library. You can also find it in those writing guides. There'll be links to using EndNote. It's a little bit better maybe for grad students because it's fairly complicated, but there's other ones that are good for undergrad students. The only problem is to warn students if they're using a bibliography builder to double check because they often make mistakes. So they still have to edit the final version. Uh, can I make a comment here? Sure. Uh, this is interesting that you say your expectations, and this is so critical because we even give, we tell them, journal of bacteriology, we make a worksheet from it and ask questions and they practice and we give them, we actually write out the lab manual citation, but when we write it out we say name of experiment, page XXX to oh, XXX, and that's what they do. They put it in, their <laughs> in their paper it says name the, of experiment. Yes, yes. experiment. They don't, the name is experiment. <laughs> That you know, gets us into commenting. There's, there's always going to be a little bit of, of work with this. 
we're going to get to commenting on papers pretty soon. Uh, this is just, a, again, briefly. Uh, I, I, the most impactful history, I mean, English class I've ever had in my entire life was when I was a, a, a just starting off at a community college, and the instructor, I remember his name, John Crisp, took one student's paper, put it up on the screen, and then had the entire class talk about it. And that really helped me understand how other people read my writing, what they care about, what they notice, what they see. So anytime you have, you can give students a class to do, a chance to do in-class feedback, to talk about one another's writing. They don't need to be experts. All they need to do is say, this is how this sounds to me, right? Just giving that extra, extra bit of information can be really helpful in knowing how an audience is going to read what they're doing. Uh, just a real quick kind of self-serving <laughs> question on the previous one. The, uh, what, what classifies as, uh, uh, say, of course, we have to get the 2,000 words, OK, but we're talking about writing and rewriting an intro. So if they have a two-page intro that they rewrite three times, how many pages have they written? It's the final, the final intro number. So you can't include the count, you can't include the count for, of drafts. OK. Uh, that does kind and of that 2,000 can be broken up in any way you want. Yeah. You know. Uh, I have a question maybe for the group. How do you get students to really buy into the in-class feedback instead of just sitting there? Yeah, I, I, this is going to be always be a little bit easier in smaller classes, but you can use electronic sources like Turnitin and such, where people can do in to the do the peer review feedback. And you can keep track of that as you're going, and you can consider it part of the grade. Um, I've seen people do things like like uh, well, I've I've had instructors who will order the peer review workshop and will come to the class and actually run the peer review in the class while the students have their papers. Okay. So the, the key is is training the students how to do a peer review. That, that video that you guys sit around from MIT about why do peer review and see how to do it, it, that's a good uh, video to play with the students before they do the peer review. I'll try and send that around to y'all again. We'll send you copies of these slides, too. I, I guess I had thought about this before, but we do this to train. We have so many different TAs that are grading the assignment. We take you calibrate. and calibrate, which would be great for the class to you do. You should do it in class. You should because, calibrate. And that will give you the feedback if they all think right. they're. Take an example it. paper, which is what we're going to do next. Your little one page thing here that you have, the student paper, that's what we're going to do. We're going to calibrate. Okay, so we'll show you what we do. And uh, in, in the interest of time, I just like saying that. It sounds so fancy. I don't know why. <laughs> um, I'm going to move ahead to where we're going to do an assessment. And I'll, I'll make copies of this, the, these slides available. Um, I can send emails to people or anything along those lines. So let's look at the assignment you have, the paper you have, about how uh, the Cold War created Twitter. It did. And, and Valerie's going to talk to you about assessing this paper. I have kind of what the guidelines were for this assignment when the student received it. Name something from your experience, either daily or from your past, that originated in the Cold War. This could be an attitude, a way of doing things, into our particular understanding of how the world operates. Discuss the origin of the thing you selected and how this in origin influence, how it would become, I had a typo, how it would uh, become something that impacts your life today. Minimum of 250 words. I is the instructor. The instructor will evaluate whether it's a meaningful project. And the assignment is, is you're writing a proposal for a history paper for the semester. So we've already had some people talk about using that kind of assignment. So, so you're writing to your instructor. instructor. Now, uh, I just want to say a couple things about feedback. First of all, I mentioned before the difference between formative feedback and summative feedback. Informative feedback is the kind of feedback you give before you give a grade so that people can use it to make corrections and changes. And the idea there, it actually is quicker to do formative feedback. When you get into summative, it takes you longer. So what you want to do is kind of push your time into doing more formative feedback. Now, if you're really pressed for time, you're going to do a good peer review. And you're going to do something like where everybody in the class kind of calibrates on a particular paper that's similar to what they're going to do for each other in the beginning of the class, and then you have it do it with them do it with each other. We have a workshop where we can show you that. We have a video that we will send you out from MIT that shows that. I'll send you some resources and, on how to do that. But that kind of formative feedback is what we're really trying to go for to teach students about the, the writerly habits and how writers have to revise, right? 
So um, that also gives you a better final product and it's easier to, to, um, to grade. Another thing you want to think about is don't use track changes for God's sake. And don't do this. Here, see how much, I don't know if you can see it in the back, but this is the purple pink pen is my comments on this paper. So this was just my notes on what I could, what I could comment on, every little single thing. You don't want to do that. So what you want to do is make a difference, understand the difference between editing and teaching, okay? So editing is where you go and you fix every, every single error. And I know you think, if I fix the error, they'll go back and they'll look at the paper after and they'll go, oh, she changed that comma to a semicolon. Let me think about why she did that so I can do that in the next paper. Uh-uh, that doesn't happen. When I was in uh, college, um, I had this student teacher, I was an English major, and I had this teacher who kept putting CS on my paper, CS, CS, CS. Paper after paper, I could never figure out what he meant, and I was too shy to go ask him. Finally, when I started teaching writing, I understood it was a comma splice. A comma splice is something English teachers hate. Not all of us care about comma splices. The British do them all the time. But a comma splice is where you put two independent clauses together join them with a comma instead of a semicolon or a comma and a coordinating conjunction. Who cares, right? But English teachers do care about this. And it would always give me a lower grade because I never fixed my comma splices. Because I never bothered, as an English major, to look in the handbook. So, and I was a good student. I ended up as a professor. Just imagine that your students are not going to do that. Okay. So that makes it kind of a little bit scary when you're trying to come in on papers. But you want to give enough feedback on the final paper so they understand their grade, but not so much that you have to fix every error. You want to give them a general comment at the end that comments on, if possible, something they did well, something they need to improve, and um, something you suggest maybe that they do going forward. That's especially important if you're just trying to, um, well, you can do that on a draft as well. If you're just trying to get them to kind of think about what, what's the next step. Um, you, you can also, if you care about grammar and punctuation and things, make one of your comments about that, but at least one comment about content. And that means like the quality of the argument, the development of ideas, the quality of the evidence they use, the organization, those kind of, maybe even the, the way they addressed or handled their audience, the general level of style. Those are probably more important than things like periods and commas. I, as, as W course instructors, those of you who are, those of you who are not teaching freshman English, the expectation isn't that you're going to teach those very basic kinds of skills. If you know how to and you want to, great. Hopefully they will have learned those later and they'll be learning them as they go along. Um, there's only so much you can do, in other words. Minimal marking is a technique you can use where you go and, and you tell students, if I see an error in that line, I'm going to make a check mark in that line. And then you need to go back in and figure out what the error is and fix it. Another way you can do it is just do, use a, the comment feature. Don't use track changes because you know what will happen, right? You'll do the editing. They'll accept the changes. The only time I'll use that is if I want to show an example. So maybe I'll say a paragraph is wordy. And I want to show them how to make it less wordy. So I might use it there. But then I'll say, I have made this paragraph less wordy. Now you go back and do it on the rest of the paper. You find other places. I might mark one error, one comma splice error, CS. And I might say, comma splice, C, and then I'll have a link to a writing center handout. We actually have a three minute video on comma splices if you're really interested. <laughs> um, and then say, you find the, you make sure there are no more in the paper. Maybe in the end I'll say you had some comma issues. So make sure you revise thinking about the commas. Check with the writing center if you need help with commas, right? Something like that. So you're not showing them every error. You're just going to point out some of the ones, especially the ones that bother you the most, because you're the reader, you're a professional. Error analysis is something where you go in and you don't count every single error as a separate error. You look for clusters or groups of errors. So it could be there are three comma splices and three other comma errors. So you can group those as 
types of comma errors or just comma errors, but you're grouping those, you're counting them, you're thinking of them as one error being repeated over and over. So it's not like you never should count the errors. You have X number of errors, and therefore your grade is docked this much. Don't get too hung up on the grammar part. Um, and then rubrics are also a really helpful way to make your grading more consistent and more quick. We have things on our teaching site that I showed you that shows you some example types of rubrics that you might be able to modify for your class. I can help you create a rubric if you need to. Now let's really quickly take a look at the handout we gave you, the one pager. And I want you to go through that and I want you to mark it the way I marked it. In other words, it's not going to the student. It's going just for you to see what do you see in this paper that you think you might want to comment on, yes? A plug for rubrics. If you use turnedin.com, you can upload your rubric to turnedin. You can upload the criteria. You can upload the definitions of the different evaluations. And then all you do is pull up the rubric, read the paper, click, 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 and it calculates the grade for you, and the comments are in so, so how do you recommend that it's a real time saver? You can go to ITS for help with turnitin.com for using those. They, they have other markup things too. Or if you're really old fashioned, you can even create your own set of canned comments. So you have one comment for comma splices and just cut and paste it in there each time. Be careful about turnitin.com though, it doesn't find all mistakes. I don't, I don't use it for that. I don't use it for oh, we have a way of using turnitin for commenting on papers. And I strongly urge you not to focus on errors. I strongly urge you to look at a paper in terms of content. Is the content right? Two, is the organization right? Three, is the style appropriate? And last, comment on errors. If this is a draft, who would spend time working on errors if you're just doing a draft? Also, if this is what our students are conditioned to get from teachers, is feedback on all their mistakes, which doesn't necessarily uh, get them excited about doing the writing. Stay away from my position. Stay away from marking the errors. It just makes them mad. Um, and you know, I'll second that and also say that if you grade a draft, put a grade on it. I know you feel like they won't do it if you don't put a grade on it. But if you put a grade on a draft or if you mark too many errors, that's not giving them an incentive to revise. Because once they get a sentence right, they don't want to change it. Uh, so what we're trying to do is teach them how to revise even if they're a good writer, yep. right? So the grades on drafts are problematic. Uh, make sure that they're not a large percentage of the final grade if you do it. And remember, it takes you longer if you're going to put a grade on the draft. But if you have to, you have to. Uh, okay, so take a, let's take a look at this. I have a yes. About that. Um, because the way that I, I have not taught a writing course before, but the way that I know the people in my discipline have done it, is they give a grade on the draft, but then any revisions only increase that grade. In other words, that the revisions are not, the draft is not a separate grade. So she said they give a grade on the draft, it's not a separate grade, but the revisions increase that. I only think, I think that number one, by putting a grade on your draft, it's gonna take you longer. Number two, by, you know, if you, if, Increasing the, is good as long as you make everybody do it. Once they're satisfied with the grade, yeah, I only true. wanted to see. Yeah. I'm stopping. So you're kind of uh, stopping them from doing more revising. And I want my A students to revise too. Leslie. So a lot of the stuff we are only able to really just touch on. So I'm going to really quickly go through it. Um, if you give your students some sort of personal investment, whether it be recognizing how something they're talking about relates to their own experience or to their family's experience or where they come from, or to what they're going, their future self is going to be, they're going to get a little bit more engaged. They're going to be more attentive to what they're doing. They're going to care more about saying the things they're saying. Um, you want to give, take that information and then show them why you made the choices you made in terms of what the expectations for the assignment are. Uh, if you scaffold with this, if you say this is the reason why we're building this step by step, this is the value of the end product you're doing, it's going to, again, going to keep that personal investment. It's going to give them reasons and an understanding of why they're doing what they're doing, which is going to make the results a little bit better. Um, and you usually make the, the marking easier as well because you're, you're, you're stepping them up through the process. Some of the errors you saw at the beginning are not going to be as prevalent at the end for most people. 